This is the Idea Time Show, Idea Time Show with Dr. Joe North, helping facilitators expand their creativity, confidence, and impact through the power of innovation in action. Gain confidence as a facilitator, confidence with the technology, and confidence with your content and event design. Tune in every week for practical tips, strategies, and interviews that will accelerate your personal and business success. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe North. I've got a very special guest for you in this week's podcast. It's Patrick Dunn, who is the author of Boards, a brilliant book for board members, aspiring board members, whether you're a seasoned campaigner, a novice board member or aspiring. It's a wonderful book. And in this show, we talk about how to create a great board environment, what a good board actually looks like, uh, how boards can influence innovation and growth. We talk about conflict and creating healthy, creative tension rather than disruptive conflict. Patrick shares loads of tips as well on, on listening, how to interject how to influence. We talk about the combination of humility and confidence and how to grow those and so much more besides. One particular observation that I loved that Patrick made amongst many is that it's important as a board to not play the player but to play the ball and for everybody on the board to be really focused on the outcome and you know that any any turbulence and, and discussion on the way is about achieving the best results overall to get the best outcomes. So this is really rich in content. I loved this conversation and learned so much from it, and I think you will do too. So let me and Patrick know what you think. Patrick, it is brilliant to welcome you to the podcast. I feel really honoured. You're an absolute uh, world class global expert when it comes to all things regarding boards, businesses, entrepreneurship, innovation. You're a published author several times and you've worked with some amazing companies around the world. So a big welcome to the podcast. And can I start off by asking you about what you do um, and how you came to do what you do? Yeah, well, what I do is 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 lovely really it's a mix of different things so i have a few chair roles uh with the ey foundation and ESSA, which is education sub-saharan africa i have a business called board delta which does um stuff for boards so training and advisory um and then i have a couple of other things that i do kind of um hobbies and and uh, an interest so i'm at that very lucky sort of stage where I do a sort of mix of different things they all are very fulfilling in different in different ways and it seems to work as a as a portfolio together and you've got a fascinating background and journey haven't you you've done some really interesting things I suppose so yeah I mean um I I always think I've only just only just got going really I still feel that despite what what the stage I'm at but I was born in a in a place called Toxteth in in Liverpool, which is not a natural place for board members to come from, but um, and I'm from an Irish sort of immigrant family, so I had all, all the usual stuff around uh, around that. I'm mildly dyslexic, so I wasn't very good at quite a lot of things at, at school, but um, was okay at maths. So I did maths at university with, at, at Warwick, then got into the chemicals industry, and then. Um, uh, private equity before it was fashionable um, and then in my spare time I built a number of social enterprises and have worked in spent quite a lot of time in Africa working in you know difficult slums and rural areas around education so quite a mix of things and I, I love conflict so um, I guess I was born in a conflict rich zone um, and I've done um, lots of interesting things over the year around conflict, particularly with young people helping them to manage conflict more effectively. Um, but I've also done um, a workshop for murderers and rapists in a South African prison. Um, so I've had a um, charmed, <laughs> charmed life really since um, since I went to university, and yeah. uh, it's changed my life. You've done some amazing things, and we'll dive we'll dive into all of that shortly. Um, and you're also a mathematician, aren't you? And you love solving problems. I do. Well, I suppose 
um as a kid i just loved puzzles and i loved things and uh i for some bizarre reason sort of um had a deep attachment to the triangle and and geometry and all of that and i was really interested in in, in that um and then that interest obviously greatly furthered by being able to go to warwick which is an amazing place to do maths and even then you know it was sort of um not that older university then but it was a great it was a great place and then my jobs have always used maths and i use maths in the boardroom quite a lot on behavioral stuff as well so um i'm quite interested in that um yeah awesome so um so lots to dive into you mentioned conflict and sort of growing up in that environment and i think healthy conflict uh, is really invaluable for in all sorts of walks of life uh, particularly in business as well um so your your particular one of your particular interests i know you've got many is in the performance of boards yeah. and the role of boards and how boards can perform well together so um so how did that start and what are your observations and insights that you can share about the, the role of the board and what makes a great one and what makes a not so great one? Yeah, so uh, I suppose um, my the, the real catalyst for getting involved in, in boards was um, a, a couple of board meetings which were really awful that I went to as an, as an, an investor. And I, I kind of thought early on in my career that the better the board we had, the more money we'd make and the less hassle we'd had. So um, I started to think about, well, what does make a good board and what do make good board members and how can you help a board that's that's sort of not working well together work better? And so I, I started to sort of get a lot involved in that and did quite a lot of work around that. And um, we ended up at, at 3i doing a lot of training around board skills, a lot of um, quite innovative things about um, the way we picked board members and um, the way we um, developed uh, board members and so on. So that that was a sort of kernel of interest. And then um, it struck me that at a really bad board meeting, that, that most of the issues that boards have are, are down to purpose, people or process. And if you can have clarity of purpose, you can get people aligned behind that purpose. You can get the right people working together in the right way. And you've got a good sort of straightforward simple process then other things being equal you know it's probably going to be all right but if you haven't got those things then you probably you know if one of those corners of the triangle if you like is is a bit wonky then the whole thing sort of collapses so um that 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 was really a sort of lightning light bulb moment and um then i ended up on the higgs review which was a review of the um the, the governance of large listed companies in the UK about 20 years ago. And I started to write about it. And then people um, uh, asked me, you know, to, to help <laughs> when things got, mm -hmm. got tricky. And so um, I've had a lot of experience with um, boards that need help. Um, and, and you learn so much for the boards you chair yourself with that. Um, and I find, you know, even though I've been chair for a, quite a while now, of, of different things I, I every every time you learn something um so uh it, it's yeah. just a fascinating environment to be in it is i love um purpose people and process that's really you know, memorable and something everybody can work with and yeah. i think it applies to all teams uh including boards doesn't it if, if any project team or innovation oh, yeah. team it's a, it's a great um framework and structure structure to mm. use so if um if if someone's listening or watching this and thinking well um i'm a member of a board or i chair a board and you know it's all right but uh, it could be so much better what would some top tips be from you to to make sure that that purpose people and process is really working in practice yeah, well, I think you you often need a catalyst, and that catalyst can be an event like you have a really bad quarter, or you know uh, there's a really bad argument, or something like that, and you can sort of use that uh, difficult situation to say, actually, you know, we probably need to think about how we're doing things a bit differently. Um, you can use um, external people, um, you know, maybe you have an advisor, or maybe um, 
you know you um you can talk about uh, something you've been to or something to you need some sort of catalyst to get things going and then i think you need um to think about um just calmly really you know if it's a business you know well actually could we make more money if we worked it differently uh, if it's a charity you know could we have more impact if we um if we worked in a different way could we get more money in um to to the business or the charity because people think we're better governed or people think we're more um sustainable you know we're more likely not to fall over because we don't care about risk or uh things like that so i think generally speaking it's better to root these things in something that will deliver something useful rather than the theory of you know well we must do this because it's good for you i generally find people are more motivated by things that will you know um enhance them or their business uh in in, in some way yeah and we talked um we touched on your particular interest in in conflict earlier yeah. and of course you know it's the diversity of backgrounds opinions expertise that can really make a board shine and it's that diversity as well that can make it sometimes hard work and lead to that conflict. So it's a fine line, isn't it, in terms of getting that right? Yeah. And I think, um, you know, for, I, I imagine um, many people, I know I have worked in environments where there's been at least somebody um, on that senior team that, you know, I'm talking about in the past now, where that, you know, not quite trusted, um, the dynamics not quite right. And um, so, and, and I'm, I think a lot of people have been or are in are in that place. So how do we get the best from that conflict? So it's creative, positive tension, yeah. rather than something that leads to lack of trust, dissent, and suboptimal performance. Yeah, it's a it's a brilliant point, Joe. And and, and that 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 lively tensions. I mean, you know, uh, if you don't have it, then it's a bunch of clones, or you get groupthink and mm. all of that. So you do want to stimulate that, but it, it's actually the ability to manage conflict rather than kind of uh, anything else. And I think if you if you watch really good leaders, you know whether they're of a team or of a chairing a board, they they generally do have that ability to tease out conflicting ideas, conflicting personalities, all of that, and then actually you, use that. And that can be the catalyst for. For, for change and for new ideas or a better way of doing things but they they have this way of bringing everybody together as well mm -hmm. and i think it's all down to to culture really so um you know if if when i've started things up so for example essa um in africa or i've taken on a new chair role then i generally spend you know a little bit of time just saying you know well, how are we going to work together everyone you know the board itself the board with the subcommittees the board and the subcommittees with the management and I, and I think in sort of venn diagrams so that um you spend a bit of time talking about what's that bit in the intersection that and how are we going to have this we've got a great range of diverse talents and and characters and and all the rest of it how are we going to bring out the best in, it, in 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 each other so it's absolutely okay to say things that you know you you feel strongly about you feel um you know might, might be different or you feel are important but everyone has to do that in a respectful way um and we have to listen to people and and when people talk about trust i i think often it's a very narrow sort of thinking about what they mean by trust i i think it's trust in competence as well as trust in you know i trust what you say um it's trust that that person will do the right thing mm -hmm. i think the better people know each other um you know for example i know you know you, um the, the, the board where you are you know they they seem to know each other pretty well but it's not cozy um you know there's a good challenge to it a, a good critical friend yeah bit. yeah um and, that, and that's really important so that, i think the chair has to create that atmosphere um and then i think um ensure also that there's a really good feedback kind of and reflective kind of thing so that you know if someone does stray off into uh unhelpful territory you can you can sort of quickly nudge them back um mm. rather than you know having to wait for yeah. a while and have an awkward conversation 
It's interesting, isn't it? There's the the work um, that David Meister has done on trust, um, and he defines trust in business as being around, um, you know, credibility, um, authenticity, and openness, reliability, um, divided by um, the the view of self um, self orientation, self interest, and it's about. Um, me being really clear about what my interests are, but also wanting you to achieve your interests as well. So we trust people when those, uh, those all those dynamics are in place, which I think is a really useful um, framework. And I think as well, it, it is absolutely, you know, a great chair can be transformative in facilitating um, that culture and that environment. I think it's also on the board members to be self-aware and to learn the skill of being challenged and receiving challenge and also uh, giving challenge in a really constructive, healthy way. So it's sort of on everybody, isn't it? It's that individual and team responsibility. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, constructive challenge is not an individual sport. I mean, I, I recently did a LinkedIn article all about constructive challenge by coincidence. Mm. Um, um, it's really interesting when you when you look at, you know, the people understand why why it's useful first of all because i think it helps to motivate you particularly if you're more introverted to to realize actually you might, you might actually do something really useful here by asking a really good question what people often have problem with is not why it's a good idea but how do you do it um how do you get into a conversation when you know it's chuntering the wrong way um how do you kind of um, make your points in in the right sort of layered way um that kind of thing how do you build on someone else's challenge um uh, it, it's fascinating actually when you mm. start to think about it it is so what what are a few tips that you could give us for how to so i, I suppose some tips are how to butt in politely but with confidence um you know, how to redirect that conversation if it's if it's tootling off in a in an unhelpful direction, those sorts of things. So what what tips could you give us? And I like the layering as well. I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. So, um, well, to get into the conversation, I, I think this is one of the hardest things. And something I found quite difficult early on because I, I'm, um, despite the sort of speaking and writing, I'm a bit, bit introverted. And I would find I would sit there dreaming up the perfect sentence to say or the perfect question. And then the moment would go by. Yeah. And then I'd be having to make my point at a, you know, I was sort of, oh no, it's gone, you know, I need to, and uh, and actually, uh, I, I just watched and learned. I spent a lot of time watching and learning, and still do. And I noticed that there was a word that was really, really helpful to just get into the conversation or slow things down so that you could get people to think about something differently. And and it's the most simple word. It's I. So, you know, if a conversation's chuntering on, you haven't spoken for a little bit, uh, and, and you say I, the, the chair will usually say, well, you know, I've had to, you know, um, you know uh, what, what, what have you got to say? And, and, and I find the words that follow I are really helpful too. So I'm not quite sure I understand that. I'd really like you to go through that aspect of this particular risk or whatever it is in a bit more detail for me, please. Um, I'm not sure that feels right in terms of where the market is, or I wonder what the competitor reaction will be to that. I is a really helpful, gentle way into a conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, most people who study ways of constructive challenge will tell you about the escalator approach. So, you know, you just kind of start with a question like the one I've just said, and then you gradually, so you go from a sort of gentle probe to a full on attack, you know, sort of as you go up the escalator. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the thing I find is, particularly in virtual situations, the, you know, people sort of ask one question, and everybody gets one question, and then they go round again. And actually, it's, it's not as good an inquiry tool if you do that, because actually, most of the really crunchy points come on your second or third sort of question behind that first entree one. So I describe this as, you know, it's like an escalator in a department store where most people seem to get off at the first floor, have a wonder about, see some stuff that they get really interested in and forget what they came for, which is on the third floor. So I think the art of um, the chairs, I think it's something I think about a lot, is how do you kind of get the depth 
that you need, but give everybody the opportunity and how to cover the ground of issues that you need to do. And fundamentally, I, I think it's always better to have, to do a few things really well than lots of things poorly. I think the other thing that can be quite useful, again, again if you're a bit introverted, is um, my, my, my grand told me I was a little boy that, you know, um, that it's really important to listen to what people say, but it's even more important to listen to what they think. And I spend a lot of time looking at the faces and, and generally in life, you know, I think if the, the CEO is kind of bullying it, it's usually all over the CFO's face and you can see some anxiety on the CEO, CFO's face, the more exaggerated the CEO might get about stuff. And, and actually, you sometimes just have to look at them. Um, but sometimes you might say, you know, well, I, I wonder what Mary, you know, the CFO thinks. And, and that is a very gentle kind of thing to say, but actually could open up. Mm -hmm. But then you're putting the CFO under pressure to say, well, actually, no, it's not quite that good. <laughs> you know, there's this other yeah. thing that it's, <clears throat> Excuse me. It's very powerful, isn't it? Um, in, in a nice, subtle, doable way. Um, if yeah. It feels like quite yeah. a safe way of, of doing that. And what do you notice about the boards that are more innovative and entrepreneurial? Because you work across a whole whole range mm. of organisations around the world. So you see all sorts of interesting things. Um, what are some of the similarities that you see, you know, amongst great entrepreneurial thinking, innovative thinking um, from all of those backgrounds you can distill for us? Yeah. So, so first of all, I think about, you know, what's innovation? So I mean, a lot of people just describe it as, you know, new products or new ways of doing things. Mm. I, I, I would add a very important word to the front of that, and that's successful new products or successful new ways of doing things. Uh, I think um, real innovation is, is kind of, you know, you're changing the way that things are done. Yeah, you know, you're introducing something. And so I think um, it's hard to embody often the person who might have the spark for an idea, the person who has the idea, and then the person who turns that idea into a successful reality. And so, you know, you're incredibly lucky. You know, the, the Bill Gates and those sort of people, they're, 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 they are exceptional. Um, usually, and, and even in, in those cases, they do need other people. So it's not an individual's thing. It's a collective thing. But I think the... Um, have, having your eyes open to the possibility that something could be better, being prepared to do something that no one else has done. So with, with ESSA, we've done a number of things in sort of, we, we work on big systemic problems in African education, and we've done a number of things where, which have been really innovative. Um, so for example, lots of people complain about, you know, crowded university classrooms. And so we we said, well, actually, you know, if the population is what it is now and it's going to be a billion more in 10, 15 years and you're struggling with, you know, the ratios of student to the capacity uh, and yeah, then actually this is a really urgent problem and we need to do something about it. But but we we believe actually evidence can be really helpful so often when people talk about innovation they talk about well you know kind of this guy had this bright idea this woman had this amazing idea and that's you know often a part of it but actually they also then went and tried to evidence whether people did really feel like that about this product or that problem and and sort it so i, I had the idea for as a uh, on a flight from um, Accra to Johannesburg, and I wrote the the kind of plan for it on on a sick bag because I'd run out of paper and I'd run out of laptop battery. Uh, but we didn't form an organisation um, just based on that. We then did some proper work to think actually these things that I think are big problems like the faculty crisis, the lack of visibility of African research. Some of it are they are they real problems? And so we got someone to to sort of prove, yeah, they're actually, they're really big problems. Um, and then we thought, right, well, doing what we're doing currently doesn't work, uh, clearly. So we need to do something quite different. And then we started to come up with ways of doing things differently. That So the innovation was sparked by a problem. 
that had evidence and then actually there was a lot of work on you know well given the scarcity of resources how can you do this with limited resources and mm. yeah. I think yeah not an, not a lightning bolt it's a it's a process um, yeah i couldn't agree more i mean it's a process that is often um triggered by a spark of creativity um that creative moment and insight but then you're so right you know for for me um innovation it's about purposefully um solving problems that actually exist and that are worth solving and doing that in a way that so that the solution that comes out is is relevant useful and does what it sets out to do and um, from from the um, from the, the the many organisations that uh, I've worked with over thirty years um, in different places in the world, I think one of the biggest risks a board can have when it comes to innovation is complacency. Actually, that we're comfortable, we're doing all right, thank you very much. It's not broken, so we won't um, we won't improve it, we won't change it. Um, is that something? Would your obs observations be consistent with that? And um, and, and what do you do when, you know, it, it is all, it's feeling so cushy and comfortable and, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think it's like a normal distribution where you've got both ends of this though, Joe. I think yeah. you've got, you've got boards that, and, and organisations sometimes they're complacent because the margins are high and they're making money and then oh. they don't invest and then they get caught out yeah. by a new entrant. And then you've got the other end where you've got people who are, or sort of you know you know when you do gardening you, you don't kind of you don't plant some plants and then keep lifting them up to see how they're doing <laughs> and, and and they kind of constantly stressing about it uh and, and they don't get the value from the products that they've already got so they're they're in they're sort of over innovating if you like but not being successful because of that so then the neat place to be is to think well you know we, we've we've hit the jackpot with this product um but you know think about its like likely life cycle think about kind of okay so what what we're going to do with the the you know the proceeds of that to build the the products coming behind or the services coming behind or developing markets that different places I, I think a lot of people don't extract the full value from the things they've already got and innovation to many people means new products rather than innovating with what you've already already got and making it just a lot better yeah because it's that um every product or service has a life cycle doesn't it so there's um and every brand actually um you know every every business in its entirety so there's um it'll you know an upward trajectory hopefully over time but as soon as that starts to plateau um it's about thinking okay let's kick start the next growth curve and, and and keep that going and and seeing that you need to do it before you need to do it so that you're ready for it um when, when it happens and i i think a number of organizations now and and you know i, I have this one to have horizon boards or you know kind of uh shadow boards or they're called all sorts of things uh where they're getting uh, feeding innovation to the board through you know a, a group of people from across the organization who might be younger or you know not not be natural board members but they're just you know and and, and stimulating and challenging and and because uh, often it's the challenge that produces the thing well yeah we could you know i know a way to do that because amongst your if you've got a properly diverse group there'll be some problem solvers yeah and it's it's the um the different perspective as well and um keeping feet on the ground knowing you know and, and the trends that are happening out there um i was talking to someone uh, to an amazing um young woman and she's she's 26 and she was saying look i don't google anything um me and my friends we don't google you know she's a, a professional uh, we we look at things if we want to find out about a business or somebody we look on TikTok, you know, and um, it, it's just really understanding uh, and staying in touch with with those changes as well. So I think I I really love so it's a horizon board or a shadow board, and that's younger or different people um, bringing yeah. that bringing that challenge. I love that. I think that's uh, fantastic. So the EY Foundation, which I chair, we have a youth advisory board, and the chair and the vice chair that sit on the main board. And uh, actually, tomorrow we've got a meeting of our, we call it the YAB, we've got a meeting of the YAB, and I'm really, really looking forward to it because they're, they're always brimming with. It's energizing, ideas. isn't it? 
and yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, so I, I I love it when people sort of see opportunity that I haven't thought about. You know, it's um, it's inspiring. So um, how do you think can board leaders um, and probably particularly executive directors, um, business owners, create a culture of innovation? so that the whole organization is thinking creatively and innovatively in a purposeful way yeah um i think i mean as you know there's there's lots of evidence that you know it's not by setting up a committee or you know telling someone you know you're responsible for innovation or something like that i think it's it the the the, the, the most important thing is the people that you recruit so when we re- we were starting up essa um it's a very slow paced in um in terms of change the 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 african education world and uh so we said you know one of the most important things we need is you know pacey people uh so they have all the technical skills all the other things that we need but they've got a drive in them and and a restlessness that you know actually this is really urgent this problem that we're trying to solve and whatever the problem would be and we need to get on with it and we need to find new ways of doing things so um and you interview for that um so you know now um we're relatively young but we're up to 20 people and um we've we've, we've got you know actually they're just packed full of drive but they've also got you know in terms of the leadership um we've got it's controlled drive it's not just driving about in yeah. random directions. Yeah. it's got a, a direction to it um so i think it's in in terms of the people that you recruit and then creating a culture where it's absolutely okay to challenge no matter who you are where you are kind of what you do um everyone can you know can can contribute to that it's not just a bunch of clever people in a dark room or the the board or anyone else Every, everyone's thinking about how can we actually contribute to this um and then also respecting people who just want to get on and do something so there are some people who just actually just are fantastic producers and they don't they don't want to get involved in the creative side they just like you know delivering this particular service or making a product and respecting them and not actually thinking any less or more of them for for doing that they're they're playing a really critical part if you have everyone who's jumping up and down with new ideas every five minutes you won't get anything done no Um, and it it would be chaotic wouldn't it 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 comes down to playing to everybody's strengths doesn't it and um, everybody's preferences and and having that that blend of you know, people producing great work and people having great ideas about the next piece of great work and, and putting putting all of that together. Um, so from from your perspective then, so you, you've written, um, you know, you've written about this and, and published um, about this and you, you facilitate amazing sessions as well. So how do you think... Um, people chairing boards or people on boards or people aspiring you know there'll be a lot of people listening to us today who are aspiring to be on on a board and you know on their way on that journey um how can people really work on themselves to you know to get there and deliver the best that they can yeah well i suppose you know there is some uh, there's a piece of research actually at harvard business school which showed that the more self-aware you are, the higher your performance on doing three things. So making decisions, um, coordinating and uh, managing conflicts, all three things that boards do a lot of. So really asking for feedback, reflecting on, uh, you know, how did you perform at that meeting? How did you perform um, in that interaction with someone? Uh, Thinking a lot about that. And, and getting the feedback, getting a good coach, a mentor, really critical. I mean, I was so lucky because so many people were really kind to me when I was kind of young and unruly and kind of not, kind of um, uh, not, not a very rounded kind of person, you know, uh, for, for for all sorts of reasons. And and I found, you know, the generosity of people is is extraordinary. Um, if you ask them for advice, if you ask them for for views. So I think that's a sort of key thing. Then 
I think watching and learning, um, you know, really, really watch. If you think someone's really capable, you know, watch, have a think about how did they manage to do that? Mm -hmm. um, and, and what words did they use? You know, because somehow when I make that point, no one listens. But when they make that point, everybody listens. So, you know, think, well, why is that? And and, and that, that's important. And then how can you, um, I think particularly um, in terms of work I've done with young women to, to help them progress to board positions, I think you know, how can you not just get a sort of mentor, but how can you get a sponsor? So how can you have someone who will actually say, you know what, you should really think of Joe, uh, you know, for this particular situation. So sometimes people, um, and it's not about being shouty, probably is the reverse of being shouty, but often we overlook people in our close orbit and they might not know we're interested in getting a board position. Uh, so actually, you know, telling if you're in, in a company and you have interaction with non-execs from time to time who are on your board, you know, say to them, you know, how did you get to where you've got to, how did you get your first non-exec appointment? You know, I'd like to do that, but I don't know, I haven't got a clue where to start. Um, I, I think, you know, start with them and brand out um, and they'll generally help you or, or not all of them, but some of them will, enough of them will help you. That's wonderful advice. And I know you've got some um, really interesting views on self-awareness as well. I mean, I think um, I use 360, you know, the traditional 360 feedback um, quite a bit. I do think that can be really helpful if it's used in the right way. Um, and it's good, it, it's done properly. Uh, I know you've got some thoughts around, um, you know, how else to improve self-awareness that can be even more powerful or as powerful um, as, as the typical 360. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think, well, what is self-awareness? It, it's really having a good understanding of your strengths, weaknesses, all the obvious things, but it's also about a good understanding of the impact that you have on others. So one of the things I used to do, uh, I had a terrible habit of interrupting. So I was very enthusiastic and I would over prepare, possibly because of my d d dyslexia, I I'd over prepare. So I, so I had a I had a point of view on every issue, <laughs> so, but unfortunately, I also had the need to express it, uh, which was really unhelpful. So um, I I found you know reflecting. You know why 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 did Janet seem irritated irritated by me today? I thought I made a really good point, um, but you know it's probably the sixth point I'd made in <laughs> sort of ten minutes, so that was probably what was irritating. Ask Janet. <laughs> don't don't kind of necessarily just try and figure it out for yourself. So I think there's that kind of you know, and I, and I I would be very open about saying you know. I'm not sure I made the point very well yesterday and it obviously seemed to irritate you. I'm struggling to understand why, but could you help me? Um, and, it, and if you do it with a degree of humility, which I think is massively important for, for self-awareness, um, and I think humility combined with confidence is really quite powerful. Yeah. I think humility which might result which, which is either false self self deprecation or is rooted in a lack of confidence isn't very helpful but humility with confidence i think is really important so you've got to be confident to say to someone you know, really sorry i think i upset you yesterday <laughs> but you know what what the hell yeah. was going on you know it, and the way you say things um i learned a lot about that because of being a mathematician and kind of evidence-based and fact-based you know well, you know, surely this is the radical, logical, rad, rad, you know, rational thing to do. And people go, well, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. There's the, the emotional cool. bit and there's the, the whole sort of paraverbal, how how we say things oh. as well. It's really important. Um, yeah. And I wanted to explore confidence a little bit with you because um, I know, you know, in the lots of people I've worked with over the years again and um, is sometimes people aren't always super confident about being in that board meeting they're not super oh, confident yeah. about speaking yeah. up and you know sometimes it can particularly if it's the first one or the first few 
um, it's sort of having a deep breath, thinking about it and thinking about it. And then, as you say, you know, you were constructing the perfect sentence um, in, in the old days, as you said. But uh, sometimes it's about summoning up the courage and then the moment's gone and somebody else says the thing that you were going to say. And everybody goes, well, that's that's an amazing point to make, you know. Um, so how can I mean, I, I think it's we're not always confident, but by having a bit of courage, a bit of thought preparation and being brave we can get there but but what are your thoughts about how can people build their confidence and combine it with that humility what are some practical things they can do so i think it's back to self-awareness so you know there's a temptation to think about self-awareness only applies to weaknesses but it also applies to strengths so i and i always think you know well when i'm advising people on on situations like i think you know well what are you good at uh what do you want to do uh and what's available to you so sometimes we we think we can't speak when we actually can and people would really like us to so i would every new non-exec joined the board and i would generally have a chat with them in between them getting their first set of papers and the first board meeting and i will say to them you know well kind of what do you think of the papers and you know are there any points you particularly like to make and so when the meeting comes i can join them in at the right point and then we'll have a chat uh, a few days later as well and i'll ask them for their reflections right? you know how do we do as a board and what did you like and where did you know did was there anything you wanted to say that you didn't and and i i think there's something around that atmosphere and culture of doing that which really helps and if your chair isn't doing that then there's nothing to stop you starting to do that you know you can ask the chair you know how do you think i did yesterday did i contribute too much too little um you know what did i um what do you think um yeah because yeah. as i think sometimes when when we're lacking in confidence um we can also over interpret people's responses or misinterpret people's responses so you know, if somebody's, if we're speaking and somebody's looking bored, for instance, it might have nothing to do with us or anything we're saying. They might have something completely different on the mind or they might be completely, um, you know, uh, tired after after a really busy week or whatever. So so I think, um, I think that's actually really good for building confidence as well is because sometimes it isn't us and sometimes it is. And either way, we can learn from that um, because sort of too that too much negative self-awareness can be the stuff that holds us back um, and you might think yeah. you know well um you know joe's disagreed with me therefore she doesn't like me that that's not a natural no. conclusion to draw but it's often a conclusion we draw um we, you know why has she been so difficult you know <laughs> you know why this is a really good idea you know is she doing that because you know some I've upset her in some way or is it and it could just be that she actually thinks you know what you said's a load of rubbish and she's probably actually been quite polite about it but mm. you know, so you can get yourself into these little spirals and and I think uh you've always it's a bit like you know in sport whether, whether it's netball or football or whatever it might be you know it's it's not about it's not about playing the player it's about playing the ball um and uh, I think often we, you know, we make it more personal than it than it mm. needs to be. Um, I love that. I love that analogy. It's not about playing the player; it's about playing the ball. That's um, that's that's really really good. And um, I mean, I I've learned because it, it it helps me to see it this way. I I've learned to see people disagreeing or challenging as it's engagement and they're interested in the thing, even if they see it differently. Mm. Um, and therefore I'm grateful for the engagement and the interest, even if it's a different perspective. So so that's how I frame it personally. Yeah. And if you're outcome focused, you know, yeah. so I think, well, I, I, when I'm sort of coaching here, I always say this for a board meeting, you know, kind of what's the outcome we want today? Mm. And, you know, we, we might get, there might be some sort of turbulence to get there, but what's the outcome we want? And when, come away you know sometimes you find people feel oh yeah it's really really difficult really difficult i say yeah but you got the outcome you wanted um and actually they've added a bit of value to this part of it they've made us think about you know we might implement this in a different way mm. uh, a less risky way or a you know a less stressful way so actually you know those difficult questions were really good they added a lot of value and um 
often in board meetings, I will have a sort of 15 minutes at the end where we reflect on how did we do today? Did we rush that? Did we make hard work of it? Um, you know, how have we left the management feeling? Um, all of that kind of thing to, to help with that. Yeah, it's um, and I think the point you make there about and you, you you referenced it earlier when we were talking about not trying to do too much, not rushing things. I, I see this um, in lots of meetings, not just board meetings, just people trying to get too much done into shorter space of time and not committing the right amount of time and focus to the right things, really. Yeah, and I mean, forgive me another bit of maths, you know, the normal distribution, the bell curve, there's a relationship, I think, between how effective people are and what kind of pressure they're under. And obviously different people are, uh, find different things, uh, create different levels of pressure and they have different tolerances to pressure. But fundamentally, you know, if you want to be in that central zone of, you know, high effectiveness and the right amount of pressure, actually, you know, delegating to others uh with right oversight um is a great most most boards have um too many things on the agenda and we're all we're all kind of guilty of of that we we want to discuss this we want to discuss that but if you really focus in on the things which will make a material difference uh that you really need to discuss all together and delegate with the right level of oversight the other stuff then um then you kind of have a more you, you're more likely to be in that middle zone yeah that's um well there's lots and lots of wisdom and insight for chairs board members anyone who's in any team anywhere actually because these things are transferable and for people aspiring to be on boards as well um so lots of thought-provoking things for me actually around self-awareness um conflict love the bit about um play the ball and not the, not play the player um so lots of value and lots more besides around innovation and entrepreneurship so thank you um i know you're you're heading off um you've got you're on your travels to where was it dubai and accra when we've um, finished yeah. recording so um that sounds exciting i'm sure that um the people listening and watching will want to learn more and discover the resources and things that you've got. You mentioned the LinkedIn article. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Also um, to your books, uh, Patrick, as well. Um, but where can people find you if they want to reach out and contact you and connect with you? Where's the best place to do that? The easiest way is on LinkedIn. So um, I think there are a few Patrick Dunn's in the world, but, um, but if you put Patrick Dunn and boards, you'll probably get me sort of pretty first time or... Mm -hmm. Patrick Dunn and ESSA or EY Foundation, you'll you'll get me pretty quickly. Um, yeah. And there's links to the the articles. Um, and I do encourage everyone to sort of add comments and things to the articles. Um, um, they get they get quite a lot of traction. So there's quite a good lively debate on most of them. Yeah, yeah definitely. And um, I think uh, as well, it's D U W -N, N E, isn't it? So D U W -N, N E. D U W -N, N E. When you're looking for um, for Patrick on LinkedIn online. And also, if you are a board um, or a senior leadership team and you are looking for some of that external agitation or you want to perform even better than you currently are, then um, you know, Patrick is um, is super skilled at this. And uh, I've experienced him firsthand, so um, absolutely brilliant. So I do recommend you reach out and and connect with him and, and make that contact contact so um patrick thank you so much it's been wonderful speaking to you my pleasure thank you for tuning in to the idea time show brought to you by dr joe north don't forget to subscribe to our channel and access more completely free resources at bigbangpartnership.co.uk forward slash resources we'll see you next time